We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the workshop Framing Meaningful Access for Inclusive Digital Policies. Uh, the workshop uh, was organized by Instituto NUPEF, Alliance for Affordable Internet, Web Foundation, and CGI.br. I'm not Bia Barbosa. Uh, I'm Laura Tresca. Bia had a last minute work appointment and she asked me to, to cover her up. Uh, I'm a journalist, I'm a social scientist, I also a uh, third sector representative at CGI.br. Uh, I have been working with digital inclusion for over 15 years, and I'm very glad to join you in this workshop. As online moderator, we have Luisa Mesquita from Nick.br. As a, a reporter, we have Juliano, uh, uh, that is also from nick.br. Uh, uh, I asked uh, for the, the, the speakers to introduce themselves at the beginning of their speeches. Uh, the session uh, will start with 10 minutes presentation on the involving dis discussion about universal and meaningful internet access the key elements that constitute its concepts and how it can be measured. This block will be held by the representative of the Alliance for Affordable Internet, Sonia. Next, we will have 10 minutes presentation to access the set of elements which should be considered for key uh, for the concept of meaningful access. Carlos Afonso from UPATH will, take, will make this presentation. Then we will have an open debate and the presentation of three concrete experiences of connectivity to discuss the important elements to the concept of meaningful access. Finally, so we will wrap up the session with a summary of the contributions to improve the comprehension of the elements that destruct the concept of meaningful access and to open the floor for the audience gathering several points of views. Well, uh, in the context of a global pandemic, the range of daily activities that are done exclusively online has increased for many, but half of the world's population has been deprived of access to basic services like education, health, and civic participation because they don't have access to, to the internet. Even among those who have, who can afford uh, the use of the internet. Many do it only through mobile phones with low quality access. Then we raise the questions. What are the key elements that constitute universal and meaningful internet access? How can it be measured? How is the concept evolving in time? And what does the evolution mean for policy? Sonia, uh, the floor is yours. Please welcome. Thank you, Laura. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. Um, my name is Sonia George. I'm the executive director of the Alliance for Affordable Internet, and I lead up the digital inclusion programming at the Web Foundation. Excuse me. Uh, I'm also the co-chair of the IGF Policy Network on Meaningful Access that some of you might have heard um, with my colleague Sylvia Cadena of APNIC. And um, I'm mentioning that because uh, we're doing this session not just to clarify what is meaningful connectivity, but really to understand and help you learn more about how do we think about meaningful connectivity in the context of this more holistic approach to 
meaningful access? And how do we see these two concepts and their parts as a way to allow us to think about internet connectivity, not just as a technical solution, but as a human centered solution to support livelihoods around the world, and especially, I would say, in the global south, in low and middle income countries where digital inequality and exclusion is still and remains a major concern to all of us uh, interested in digital development. So in addition to uh, myself presenting today, I have the real pleasure of also having my colleague Ana Rodriguez joining me. She and our colleague Teddy uh, Woodhouse are really the masterminds behind the analysis on meaningful connectivity and especially the, an upcoming report that we are going to give you a little bit of a uh, early um, you know, a kind of a soft uh, share of some of the uh, findings of these new research that we've done to measure uh, meaningful connectivity around the world. So you have a very special moment here today, not just to hear from us on our thinking, but also to get a glimpse of the early findings that we are going to publish in January uh, of next year on meaningful connectivity. And Anna will share that with you within the context of how we've developed the concept of meaningful connectivity. But let's first define and clarify what all these terms are and why are we here today to talk about these. Um, some of you have already heard, but please bear with me. It's really important for us to think about meaningful access as a whole as something that facilitates meaningful use. And why is that? And I'm trying to think of these in a very pragmatic and basic way. Ultimately, our goal in digital development overall is really for every human around the world to have the opportunity to engage with technology however they choose, but with the right protections, safety, and a really good um, connectivity that allows them to do and to make the choices that they want to make. This is really important. And the reason why for us it was important to clarify these concepts is because, thank you, Anna, it's because meaningful access as a way to facilitate meaningful use, so the digital opportunity that every individual, woman, man, uh, girls, boys, rural population, what have you, can take is really based on three important elements of meaningful access. First, affordable access. We are the Alliance for Affordable Internet, so as you can imagine, we care a lot about the cost of access to the internet, and affordable access remains a key barrier around the world, especially in low and middle income countries, for people to have access to connectivity. So affordability is very important, and we can never take it away from this very important equation of meaningful access. Just as important um, is what we call meaningful connectivity. And note that I am distinguishing the terms here, meaningful access from meaningful connectivity. Meaningful connectivity is the technical foundation that allows meaningful access to become a reality, okay? Anna is gonna tell you a bit more about that. So affordable access, the cost, meaningful connectivity, the technical elements that allow us to have quality, reliable connections, and just as important, the social environment that bring the possibility together with affordable and meaningful connectivity that then allow us to take full benefit of that access, okay? And when we talk about the social environment, we talk about skills, education, content, right? Ability of having content in different languages. For some of you who just heard us speak at the main uh, session around these issues, I'm sure you've learned a lot about uh, multilingualism on the internet, for example, and these kinds of issues that are absolutely critical to make sure that the construct, this concept of meaningful access is in fact meaningful to every individual on earth, regardless of what language they speak, regardless of the level of education they have, regardless of the cost, regardless of the type of connection. Everybody should be afforded a baseline connectivity that allows them to fully benefit from the opportunity that digital access affords them. 
okay? So with that in mind, for us, that is really the foundation for meaningful use. Use of the internet for a purpose. Use in development uh, for any kind of possibility from education, uh, agriculture development, you know, crop management, uh, health sector, um, information sharing, knowledge acquisition, you name it. And again, for everyone, regardless of their background and regardless of who they are and where they are in the world, okay? This is really important for us. And so I'm going to pass on to Anna to tell you more and really focusing on that concept of meaningful connectivity and why that is so important as the foundation for everything that is built around meaningful access. So that blue uh, dot that you see on the slide, Anna is going to really zoom into it and share with you not just what it means, but also what does it look like in the world right now? Anna. Thank you, Sonia, for that introduction. And I'm going to talk about that technical concept of what's meaningful connectivity uh, that we have developed in the Alliance. So um, this meaningful connectivity concept is an attempt to raise the bar of how do we measure internet access worldwide. Um, our, we invite everyone not to measure internet just with that binary of who is connected and who's not connected, but really bring that to another level and understand how people are connecting around the world. And especially um, shed a light on how global, um, the global South is having issues um, when connecting and so meaningful connectivity for us, um, it's that we develop this because it's insufficient to measure the internet just with that binary that I was telling you before. Um, it's not enough to understand who's connected and who's disconnected. We need to understand how people are connecting and understand if this connection is really meaningful for them, if they are getting everything that they need from the internet, and if that connection is allowing them to do everything they want and need. Um, when we measure internet just with that binary of who can access and who cannot access, that gives us an illusion, um, a false illusion of coverage. So um, when we measure just with that binary, we can think that, for example, in Colombia, where I'm from, 60% of the population is using the internet. But when, we, when you really look at the numbers of meaningful connectivity, you understand that that 60% of the population um, is not having meaningful connectivity only around 20% is having that access that allows them to use the internet in a powerful way to change their lives and have an impact on their lives. So that's why we developed this concept, trying to raise that bar of how to measure that and develop this technical concept of meaningful connectivity to be able to understand how people are connecting and what are they getting when they connect. So what's meaningful connectivity? Um, from a surveys and research that we developed in the Alliance, we understood that there are four aspects that are important and are the main things that people need when they connect. Uh, first of all, we think that people should have the right speed when they connect. Um, they should have 4G at least to be able to have the right uh, speed to be able to download videos and use everything in the right um, way. The second thing is that they should have an unlimited connection. It's not enough to have one giga in your cell phone. It's not enough to have two or 10. You should have an unlimited connection that allows you, again, to do everything you want and need in the internet. Um, the third thing is that you should have the right device. Um, you, could, you cannot use the internet if you don't have the right device in your hands. So our minimum, um, our minimum, we suggest that the minimum thing that you should have as a device to be able to connect is a smartphone. Of course, we encourage people to have desktops, laptops, or tablets, but the minimum should be a smartphone with the right um, to, with the right thing so you can connect and use the internet. And the fourth aspect of meaningful connectivity is that you should be able to use it daily. It's not enough to use the internet one every three months. It's not enough to use it one every, every week. For us, it's key that people can use it every day so they can access 
healthcare information, uh, updated information, contact their family members, follow the news on new variants, for example, um, on COVID and keep themselves informed daily about the internet. And of course, uh, to work. I mean, if we cannot access the internet daily, um, some of us won't be able to work or connect to different conferences, Zoom calls. So we encourage people to use um, internet daily and that should be the minimum. So what's meaningful connectivity? Um, someone has meaningful connectivity when they can access the internet daily through an unlimited connection, the right speed, and with a device that allows them to, to connect to the internet. So these are the dimensions that I have been telling you before. Um, having the appropriate device and a smartphone, connecting with the right speed, minimum 4G, um, with enough data, unlimited data, and using it daily. So as Sonia said, we have been developing this concept from a couple of years ago, but now we have done um, a new research with surveys in different countries in the Global South. With my colleague, Teddy Woodhouse, we have been developing these, and we, we want to share with you some numbers here. Um, and just like a little, a soft launch and sharing with you some numbers. The report will come on January, but we wanted really to share with you these numbers. Um, so here you can see that in the, the, we measured these in nine countries. Um, you can see that the percentage of users, it's high for, for some of them. For example, in Colombia, it's nearly 60%. But then when you see the meaningful connectivity, number and how many individuals in that country are connecting through a meaningful connectivity, you see that that number goes really down. And most of the countries, the gap between the internet users and the, mini, the ones with meaningful connectivity is huge. And the gap there is what we need to close and connect people not only with an internet that they can access every three months, but really through a meaningful connection. Um, we measure, as I, these are the different milestones of meaningful connectivity. And here you can see that we have identified with this new research that the main bottlenecks are insufficient data and the right speed. People are not getting unlimited data and they are not getting the right speed to be able to connect meaningfully. And uh, with this new report that will come in January, we are going to as well highlight the different uh, the differences that are uh, present in rural versus urban, because we have identified that there are huge gaps as there uh, there not only in gender but also in the geographic location. So meaningful connectivity uh, differs a lot between urban locations and rural ones. Um, as you can see here in this graph, uh, when you look at the internet use in, for example, India, it's at 20%, and the urban rural ratio is 0.62. Um, that's the, the, the urban rural ratio. But then when you look at the urban rural ratio in meaningful connectivity, it goes, um, it goes down to 0 0.60, 58. So it's more than what you have in internet in the general internet use. And that's the situation for all the countries that we measured. All of them have um, a huge, a, a larger gap when, it, when you look at meaningful connectivity between the geographic location of urban and rural. And these gaps are not only present in the location, in the geographic location, but also in the gender. Uh, so women and, mer ex women and mer men experience the internet in different ways. And this is not only in the general internet use, but also in meaningful connectivity. And it's worse when you look at the meaningful connectivity numbers. Women are uh, suffering more than men when it comes to meaningful connectivity. They are not able to connect um, through a meaningful connectivity. You will know that there are disparities in the general internet use, but these um, get larger when it comes to meaningful connectivity. And that's it for now. Thank you, Anna. This is really great. So I'll just finish with a couple of points. Um, I hope this was this made sense to all of you, including our colleagues who are online. Um, two things to consider as we close on this initial presentation. One is, again, 
don't think of internet access as simply that binary that Anna was mentioning. This illusion of coverage, this illusion of connectivity that exists is really an illusion. The reality uh, in many uh, environments is actually quite different. The other thing that is really important is that, uh, and this is why it's so important for us to have these discussions on meaningful connectivity and meaningful access in general, is that we need to demand, we need to call for much greater, much greater quality and reliable connections to everyone in the world. We cannot accept this kind of reality that Anna was um, sharing with you, where not only internet access is considered uh, okay if people um, you know, have access just once a month or once a week or once every three months, we cannot accept that. That is not the kind of internet connection that we want to see the world um, you know, cheer about. We want to be able to see a, a world cheering about meaningful connectivity that allows for also meaningful access. And that's what we need to work for. So making sure that the quality of internet connection, the also affordable and the social environments all come together to make sure that meaningful access is possible and meaningful use becomes the standard reality, right? Um, so that people can choose how they use the internet. And this is what we want you to get out of hopefully the rest of the discussion as well is how do we get to that point? So I'm going to pass on to our uh, moderator, Laura, to continue. And of course, we would be happy to answer any questions and we are happy to share the uh, slides as well. So, Laura, uh, you don't probably see the room. We already have a few hands up. I don't know if you want me to help you with moderating the hands that are up here in the room, or if you, because I don't think you see the rest of the room. You only see us on the yeah. speaking line, right? So, uh, let me see if someone can sh uh, share a mic. There's two people with hands up. Should I do that, or do you want to go to the next one first? Um, I would prefer if we 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 could let uh, Carlos to to make the, uh, his presentation and then we we open the floor for the okay the okay sorry uh, colleagues but in just a few <laughs> minutes thank you <laughs> and thank you Sonia and Anna for your uh, amazing presentation uh, we know that the COVID pandemic has spotted is and growing the <laughs> Uh, which makes the whole of the Internet for Social Economic Development even more relevant. Public policies aimed to reduce the digital divide today have been mainly uh, focused on connectivity issues. Beyond the lack of infrastructure, there is a broad research agenda warning about the new forms of exclusion emerging from a world mediated by the massive adoption uh, and the use of ICTs. I invite uh, Carlos Afonso. Welcome, Carlos, to to do his presentation, and then uh, we open for for the participants. Okay. Thank you, Carlos. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can I share my presentation, my screen? Uh, I Host think... disabled. I can yes. share my screen. Yes. Yes. Yes, you can. No, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Ah, okay. Now, share. Can you see it? Yes, we Hello? can. Yes, we yes, can. can. Thank you. Okay, let's go. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the excellent presentations which uh, mentioned or referred to things that uh, uh, I, I will try to comment on, but uh, that are very well covered in the pro uh, previous pre presentations. Uh, first, for a very quick historical uh, record, when this idea of uh, uh, universal access and uh, the importance of inclusive information society came to be. First, there was a governmental track uh, deriving from an ITU resolution in 1998 proposing that the UN lead a summit for the information society and the civil society track 
wishes the people that are here from NGOs, from civil society organizations, remember the CRIS campaign, Communication Rights in the Information Society in 2001 started, which derived from the McBride Commission, UNESCO, New World Information and Communication Order. And they built, started to build a concept of communication rights in the information society from there. Then we came to Geneva 2003 to develop and stimulate a proposal to establish the foundations of an information society for everyone was the big objective, taking into account specific interests of each sector. That's the expression translating into multi-stakeholder collaboration. And the mission in the first phase was to elaborate a concept of internet governance, which we did through the creation, the, the, the work of the working group on internet governance. Then came the second phase of WISIS, plan of action with 122 items, 10 of them dedicated to the future IGF. Policies to stimulate universal access, again, relevance of idioms and cultures, which is exactly related to our concepts of uh, meaningful access. You know? And then the definition of what an internet governance forum should be. Uh, the IGF should be a non-binding dialogue based on policies, etc. We know uh, basically what the IGF has been accomplishing. Then the impacts of the IGF is important to recall. It stimulates national and international dialogues on internet governance, stimulates the creation of many national and regional annual forums, influences multi-stakeholder dialogue process, and even decision-making process in some cases in the field of internet governance and information society. In 2015 came the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and these helped drive the IGF to prioritize universal access. And we end up at the IGF 21, which we are now, universal access and meaningful connectivity is one of the two main focus themes, especially driven by the consequences of the pandemic. This is a map of the national and regional uh, internet governance forums so that you have an idea of what uh, through the IGF was accomplished in terms of the worldwide discussion of internet governance. Uh, framing meaningful access started actually with the Geneva Declaration of Principles, the WISIS 2003, which said that we should build a people-centered, inclusive and development-oriented information society where everyone can create access, utilize and share information and knowledge, enabling individuals, communities and peoples to achieve their full potential in promoting their sustainable development and improving their quality of life. You know? And uh, the same declaration said our challenge is to harness the potential of information and communication technology to promote the development goals of the Millennium Declaration. At the time, it was the Millennium, millennium Goals, and now we have the Sustainable Development Goals. In the policy paper uh, published by UNESCO and CETIC.br in Montevideo 2019 said, uh, digital exclusion refers to existing inequalities in the access. Use and appropriation of ICTs resulting from interactions with other social, economic, and cultural inequalities, such as urban, rural contrast, socioeconomic levels, education level, gender inequalities, etc. So, however, the digital divide is also linked to other aspects, such as the quality of technological infrastructure, devices and connections, digital skills, and above all, cultural capital to transform available information into relevant knowledge at an individual and not collective level. You see that the idea of universal access, access is coming from the 90s and especially from the beginning of the, the 21st century. And these are in, an interesting uh, uh, information regarding the obstacles to universal access. No? Statistics, uh, show that more than half of the world's population has some form of internet access. Most of them precarious via 
prepaid cell phones and relatively high costs with ridiculously so low data caps, while more than 3.5 billion have poor or no access to the electricity grid. Uh, in the later case, about a billion, uh, uh, about a billion, uh, uh, as found by the IEEE Village Program. And 20% of homes in the world are still without electricity. As Michael Ogier recalls, how can we expect the people and communities who don't even have a access to put the power grid to participate online in language they don't speak or with a device that when they can get it, they can't even easily charge? You know? This is important. A characterization of meaningful connectivity is sought so that parameters can be quantified that is based on evidence of relevance by the users themselves, that is universal for all gender, socioeconomic positions, and ethnicities, and that is open, unrestricted, without data caps or wallet gardens. Universal access assumes sufficient speed for contemporary internet multimedia standards, sufficient functionality on the user's device for creation and interaction without data caps and with quality compatible with everyday needs. Which are these needs? Distance learning, teleworking, teleconsultations, unrestricted use of e-government services, and of course, entertainment, which is important. We are humans. You know? Universalis, universalizing access without data caps and with permanent connectivity in all, all households is a challenge that very few countries have managed to overcome, even the most advanced ones. And households here must be understood depending on the social uh, settings that we are in. A community in a rural areas has a different need than uh, Households in a new urban area and uh, the setting, the geographic uh, organization, etc. It can be said that almost no national broadband plan, no matter how sophisticated and well planned, has effectively managed to universalize permanent fixed internet of a quality compatible with today's multimedia internet in all households in all homes. Even mobile internet via 3G or 4G still has dark areas, even in advanced economies. Many initiatives to circumvent or mitigate the connectivity challenge are mainly carried out by local organizations, the many versions of community networks with or without support, usually with the indifference of local governments. These community networks generally have precarious alternatives for accessing the internet. In some cases, they function as local networks with access to a small local server with pre-recorded content that is updated periodically when possible. In most municipalities, remote communities are beyond the reach or interest of local provider when they exist. And there remains the alternative of contracting a satellite link expensive with ridiculous data caps and long latency for many latency, sorry, for many applications in addition to a security risk, sharing a public IP via, via, via CGNAT. No, it's the same IP uh, shared with many communities, many users. Uh, low orbit satellite alternatives are usually not available to reduce latency. No? Typically, there is no strategic plan to make fiber backbones reach all munip municipalities. In general, this is left to the markets, resulting in the deepening of inequality of access. How to provide solutions to the challenge of lack of access to devices, computers, tablets, smartphones, to properly use the internet is a question. No country universalizes 4G or the new phase 5G, the new is fashionable now, no? without a future proof universal fiber network. Mitigate meaningful access in addition to widespread connectivity at reasonable cost and quality in all homes encompasses all public and private structures and facilities, especially schools, health facilities, and government services at all levels. 
is not enough to be connected. It's crucial to remain connected with the quality compatible with the reality of today's multimedia internet. So uh, this is all these questions and issues led, uh, brought the IGF to organize the policy network on, on meaningful access, as you know, which is to pur pursue the dialogue on advancing universal access. The IGF created the PNMA, preferred term over meaningful connectivity, because it encompasses all layers of the network and all modalities of use and applications. It's with this holistic view that access to the network is considered a decisive element for achieving the 17 SDGs. Access to infrastructure is, infrastructure is critical, but if this access is not inclusive, useful, sustainable, and accessible, and link it to the development of capacities and the provision of content that make them viable, it will not achieve this relevance. The IGF will support the network through co-facilitators of the multi-stakeholder advisory group and will encourage the participation of experts. The network will work along the existing IGF-related initiatives, such as dynamic collisions, best practice forums, youth engagement, etc. Uh, this is all to uh, at the end to stimulate all of you to try and participate in the ongoing policy network of meaningful access created by the IGF. Thank you. Th uh, thank you, Carlos, to, to share with us uh, all your, your knowledge. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, 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 considering this is a round table, I will open for four interventions uh, and comments from Sonia and Carlos. And then after, uh, uh, I will ask for Adriana and Roberta and myself to share with you our concrete experience for, for the debate. Um, we have a, a question in the chat um, for Sonia and uh, uh, Anna. Uh, they, they are asking, uh, Joseph No is asking, what is the economic dimension of meaningful connectivity? Uh, and, uh, um, Sonia, you said there are some people in the room that would like to, to make comments or questions. Please invite them to, to make their interventions. Thank you. Can you hear me? OK, great. So Anne and I can answer the first question. Um, and then there's others here, Laura, that have questions. So I can take them as well, if that's OK. Let's start. Um, if that's OK with you, can we start with the ones that had their hands up earlier so I don't forget? There were two people. And then we'll go to Joseph's question. And there's a few others. It was that gentleman back there. And uh, wait, there was a lady here. I think you next. OK. I think you should be able to hear, Laura. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm, my name is Ucha for record uh, from Georgia and working for the community networks and uh, Tamaz related directions. My question actually related uh, to the presentation and to the data. Thanks for, for this interesting uh, information and uh, good luck with this. It looks very interesting and very important. First of all, what's the source of the data? Uh, uh, no. Um, next question related, do you have the information about the Eastern Europe and some other, maybe the European countries, maybe um, about Canada and some other developing countries because uh, drivers of the selection are quite interesting. <clears throat> and uh, my last question, uh, uh, it's enough, okay. Many people, so thank you, thank you, thank you. And then the lady, uh, was there anybody else had their hand there? No, uh, yes, Nima. Okay, go okay, ahead. thank you, Sonia. Um, actually, I was rather shocked to hear I was also vulnerably connected since I'm also living in urban areas. So, um, speaking of meaningful connectivity. And as the report shows that um, we are not yet there and it's, it's a long way to go. So I wanted to know um, and have um, you as affordable, I mean, A for AI, 
what do you have in terms of um, plans or entry point um, on how you're going to start so as we can reach to meaningful connectivity? Because we are seeing that um, the right devices can, maybe we cannot have everyone in the world to have the right devices or get online when, whenever they want and have unlimited internet. Mm -hmm. So what um, do you have an entry point or do you um, want to, or do you have, or do you want to work with organizations that are already doing something on the ground to ensure that you are arriving at the goal of meaningful connectivity that you have in the future? Thank you. Great, thank you. And then Nima, and then we'll start answering all of them. Um, thank you. I was very much in, interested with the gaps that you, you, you showed mm -hmm. in terms of the um, number of internet users versus meaningful, meaningful. And something that's happening quite a lot, for example, in Tanzania, we are reporting that we have about close to 30 million um, people using the internet. But I always ask myself, is it 30 million people or is it 30 million gadgets? Mm -hmm. So I think when we're talking, so I wanted to just get your experience on how do you also divide, how do you get to the level of, you know, drilling down further mm -hmm. that is it actual people or is it handsets and then um, I applaud your work on on making sure that there is rural connectivity mm -hmm. and the gender divide. Yeah, but it's just to understand the, the data. How, how can you segregate the data to inform policy? Thank you. Great. Thank you. So let's start with some of those questions that are about the actual methodology, the data source, and the economics behind it. Anna, do you want to take those first? And then I'll talk to you about the, what we are doing as AFRAI, as the Alliance, uh, to address some of these things and what kind of guidance. So you start. Richard, thank, thank you for your question. In terms of the sources of the data for the internet users, we use ITU. And then for the meaningful connectivity figures, we have done ourselves um, surveys in the nine countries that we are reporting, um, household um, individual surveys in each country to get the meaningful connectivity numbers. So those are our sources. So ITU and ourselves. And then um, unfortunately, we don't have numbers for European countries or Eastern European countries. Our focus uh, is on the global south. So most of the countries that we do surveys in are from low and lo are low and lower middle income countries, but um, so yeah, unfortunately we don't have figures for European. Let, let me just add one thing, Anna, but I just wanted to let you know, and we can tell you a little bit more about it uh, later, that as part of this process that Carlos was um, explaining of the evolution of understanding universal access and meaningful connectivity and the policy network is that uh, working with the uh, uh, digital cooperation process of the UN Secretary General's office uh, and the ITU, uh, there is now an effort that is going to be in place to collect data on measuring uh, exactly these kinds of things and beyond what's called the connectivity framework of the digital cooperation process. And that um, data is going to be collected hopefully in 2022 for the first time uh, in collaboration with the ITU and its partners for all the countries for which they get data. So hopefully by the end of next year, we'll have more detailed data, including the countries in your region here. Anna, back to you. Um, and on the question of the gaps and how do we measure, and how do we make sure that we don't include uh, gadgets, but individuals, um, in our surveys, we, in the methodology, we always make a point so we can collect data from individuals and not gadgets, because we recognize that uh, when we measure gadgets, it brings the numbers up and it doesn't let us um, see the reality. So we make a point to measure individuals connecting um, to using meaningful connectivity. The economic, uh, the economic dimension of meaningful connectivity, yeah. There's always, um, the economic dimension is embedded in meaningful connectivity. We measure, um, we have different data sets that measure that economic, economic dimension. We measure every year data pricing in several countries because we recognize that we need to understand how affordable is the data in, in all the countries. And also um, we recognize that 
um, an important barrier to meaningful connectivity are the devices. So we also have a data set measuring uh, the cost of the devices um, around the world. This year, we have one covering uh, most of the countries in the world. And just to follow up on that and then the answer the last question, um, we, uh, we haven't published yet, but we hopefully will do that sometime soon uh, if our team manages to, to get there. But we collect the information and actually have really interesting analysis about um, you know, affordability across income quintiles in the different countries so that um, we don't just look at the aggregate numbers, but say, for example, Nima, you are, you are asking about Tanzania, we actually look at how affordable uh, connections are in Tanzania, not just for the aggregate average person that often is not really the average person, but across the five key income quintiles of the population. So a good example that I like to use is, for example, South Africa. Africa country that on paper in the aggregate appears to uh, have achieved um, affordability as it is measured. But for us, we don't just look at the aggregate. We say, okay, so let's look a little deeper. And is it affordable to every South African? And clearly is not. So even though on the aggregate, it appears that the country has reached an affordability target, the fact is 60% of South Africans cannot afford the internet because 60% of South Africans have much lower incomes than the top 40% of South Africans. So that's how we then, we look at the analysis and we are encouraging and helping many of our country partners to do that kind of analysis. Laura, please tell me to stop if you want, but there's just one last question that I think I didn't answer, which was what next? what to do. So in fact, here in the room, uh, my colleague Eleanor Sarpong is also present. She leads our policy work and our country engagement work in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And through our work on this uh, process around meaningful connectivity and meaningful access in general, we've developed not only a meaningful connectivity guide to help policymakers and regulators understand, as well as a civil society and private sector, uh, understand what kind of actions can they take to change this picture and to really move in the right direction. And we also work with a selected number of countries to put these actions in practice. Uh, and if there's time, we can have my colleague share some of those, or you can ask her directly, but I'm conscious of the time. So I want to make sure that I get back to Laura so that she can manage the rest of the session with the panel. Laura, back to you. I think I covered everything. Thank Anna you, well. Juliana. Uh, Carlos, uh, would you like to, to comment the questions too? Or should we move forward? Carlos? Yeah, uh, yes, Laura, probably I missed the question. Could you repeat it, please? Uh, it, uh, it, it, were, uh, it was uh, four questions uh, and... Um, uh, uh, I, I think we, we could move on with the sharing uh, the experience and then we, you, you comment all uh, by, by the end, okay? Okay. Uh, so I would like to, uh, to, to invite Adriana Lombardini from Rizomatica to, to tell us uh, her experience with connectivity. Adriana, please. Uh, uh, present yourself uh, and share with us your experience. Thank you so much, Laura and Sonia for this wonderful workshop and the panel on meaningful connectivity we just witnessed uh, a couple of hours ago was really magnificent. Well, I, I'm a Mexican lawyer. I've been uh, involved in regulation, public policy and competition issues in the let's say ICT world, telecoms, broadcasting and, and ICT. For, for many years, I was a commissioner at the uh, Mexican regulatory agency, AIFT, and have uh, worked with civil society for many years in the, the issue of access, and access to infrastructures, to services, to justice, to equality. And now uh, collaborating with Rizomatica and APC and founded uh, Conectadas, uh, an NGO for 
that is fighting for gender equality in the ICT ecosystem. And so for me, the past three years have been a wonderful uh, look and, and working also bottom up on, on all these concepts that, that I'm so glad are being revisited, reframed, and uh, by, by A for AI and, and the whole community. And when we get into the communities, when we visit the rural areas, we can then see and, and feel and touch what this meaningfulness uh, would look like at the local level. And, and, and in that sense, I agree with Jane Coffin and, and Carlos Rey, where you see that we also have to listen to what meaningful connectivity would be for a community. And it might be very different the one in the Amazonia, in Brazil, Mexico. Someone voice, other ones intranet, other ones, of course, mobile broadband, others need and want a broadcast radio, and some of them want off, and they want to produce content and their stories, their language, and, and use this technology to preserve their territories, identity, culture, and also to access, of course, information and health service. So in research program, and uh, we have worked in Brazil, in Mexico, in Ecuador, both in the policy level, uh, supporting community networks as a good alternative to market failures. So where the state or the market have not been able to provide affordable, meaningful, and I would say sustainable connectivity, because we also see sometimes in rural areas, these cemeteries of satellite dishes, some towers that were could not keep operating even with state subsidies. Large operators leave them. Somatica with like first of all with a very important methodology of respecting the autonomy and identity of every community. It has has been working with them, but they 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 lead to see First, what they dream of, what they want, what kind of services, infrastructures, and content. Then we map. So, so that's where you can sense, okay, if we want this meaningful use, what meaningful inputs do we need? What do we have in the area? Do we have some kind of backhaul, some kind of fiber? Do, uh, would Wi-Fi work here? How are we going to get a back full of 400 kilometers across the river in the Amazonia, etc. In the case of Mexico, uh, because it's also led a very uh, disruptive and revolutionary uh, support for community networks, the, the people of Oaxaca were able to become a licensee of a mobile network, initially a 2G network. So they, they have like um, um, like 21 sites, base stations, connecting 64 villages across the mountains of Oaxaca. They have applied now for, they got spectrum uh, in the 800 megahertz band. It's not enough. They only got like five megs. So now they are applying for, for at least, these 10 megahertz so they can pass for them. That's what's triggered the possibility of local villages in with very low incomes to deploy their own infrastructures. In the, infra the technology is there, more affordable prices when we have both a license spectrum or not, of course, these nonprofit networks need access to spectrum, meaningful access. 
with no charge for that spectrum because they are already doing the job of either the market of the state. So there's no way uh, any state should charge for that use. But we've seen there's tons of spectrum that is not used, that was licensed for 20 years, but never deployed because it's not profitable in those areas. So we more and more for meaningful access should fight for spectrum sharing or the, the regulator authorizing the use of spectrum in rural areas on a secondary basis, even when there's a licensee, but licensees, commercial licensees do not own the spectrum. It's a public good and it should not be left without use. In other regions, really remote regions, Rhizomatica, and this is really wonderful, is supporting uh, other technologies where internet is really a long shot, like the uh, high frequencies radios in the Amazonia. That is an efficient technology that is allowing to send voice and messages. And the community networks are developing also hardware. They are developing their devices. Altermundi in Argentina, another really good practice, has developed the Libre router, an open source router. So we see when there's funding for, for Adriana, we are we are losing you. I just want okay. you to know that we are city building. Thinking. When there's a universal service. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think your connection thanks, is thanks, getting thanks, a little bit difficult. We also have to look bottom up. Okay, I've, I've shut down my camera, hoping that will help. Perfect, that should Can help. Can you a hear little. me now? Yes, go ahead. You see, we don't always have, even in the Big cities, we don't have a really <laughs> um, robust connectivity sometimes. You don't have meaningful so, connectivity. So you mean. whether it is, yes, you, we yes. don't, uh, not on a continued basis. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. No, high latency, low speeds. <laughs> so, so it is important that we start mapping at the local level what meaningful inputs we need to be able to have some backhaul funding for capacity building uh, devices and, and a, a local project, which of course entails skills and, and the purpose of that connectivity. We do want to see connectivity used to have a, a well-being of the communities, not only have full day, full time connectivity to become digital addicts. We want sustainable development goals achieved at the local level, but with a respecting the culture of each of each uh, peoples uh, of the indigenous cultures and see how the tools, the ICT tools can help them defend their land, their language, their culture and access fundamental rights like education and healthcare. And, and so it's proven that this mobile network in Oaxaca and this uh, mesh networks in Argentina and this uh, HF radios in the Amazonia are proving sustainable. Uh, they could use, of course, help in many ways, in backhaul, in, in easy licensing, in access to spectrum in Brazil for these HF radios. Uh, they could also use some money from the USF that are hardly remain unused. So that's another paradigm we need to change. Not that USFs are destined only for the big operators that were the ones who left these communities behind. We have new stakeholders, new access models, and new and a lot of um, of knowledge in the communities. 
we want them to be able to, to share that knowledge through the ICT uh, tools. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Uh, I would like to, to invite Roberto uh, Zambrana to, to share uh, his experience and his thoughts with us. Uh, Roberto, please. Thank you very much, Laura. And uh, great to be here with a great panel. Well, I would like to comment um, a little bit of our work that we did in Bolivia from 2017 when we started. I was, I, I started and I'm still the coordinator of our local IGF in Bolivia. So from that year, 2017, uh, until now, we just recently have our, our IGF, the fourth IGF, back in November. Uh, the main issue, and it was continuing and continuing to, to be faced is universal access. And that's why when uh, in, in 2020, I was appointed to be a, a MAC member now in, in my second year, uh, we found a, a, um, a common agenda with several colleagues coming from particular countries in the global south. And we found that universal access was something that we needed to face immediately. So uh, we started to work in a proposal of a BPF. Uh, Carlos Afonso mentioned something about it. And uh, uh, we started to look for different documents we had to research because we needed to, we needed to actually justify the new uh, proposal BPF. And uh, we had three important documents that we went through. One was the report of the uh, uh, ITU, which uh, it was the 2019 report about connectivity. And that was, there was a shocking uh, uh, information there. Uh, and you may know about it, perhaps you don't, but most of the territory, we're talking about maybe 90% is already covered with at least three, five, uh, 3.5 or 4 uh, G uh, mobile infrastructure. So it's shocking to, to know and analyze why we're only connecting half of the population. And of course, one of the main thing is because of, of the price, because of the affordability of the service. And uh, Sonia and Anna already mentioned that. The second document, and I'm mentioning, uh, mentioning Sonia um, because the other document was a report that uh, Alliance for uh, Affordable Internet published those days. And again, confirming this kind of figures and confirming the situation in, in our region. And uh, another thing which is important to understand is despite all the statistics that we had that we many of our countries have, uh, usually uh, presented by the private sector, by operators, showing up interesting figure, interesting situation, saying that uh, mobile internet penetration is over 60, 70%. We all know that the reality is totally different. And it's different because one thing is to have the possibility to be connected, and it's another think to be actually connected because to be actually connected we need money that's the main problem in order to be able to pay the the the, the, the packages that we have in a very old-fashioned business model and the well the, the the other document because we we review several documents but the other important document that we needed to to re review was uh well all these sustainable development goals. And where particular, uh, as you all know, goal is number nine that says, build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. And particularly the target 9C that says, significantly increase access to information and communication technology and strive to provide universal and affordable access to the internet in least developing countries by 2020. But of course, we all know that back then, 2020, we failed to arrive to that target. And uh, that's, uh, that, that was that 
again confirmed us that we were to the right track. In and remember that we I'm talking that uh, uh, in a, in a time before the pandemic. So when uh, we finally agreed to present it and uh, we decided to, to do a main session on last IGF, etc., uh, we realized that it was important because the Secretary General, as you all know, also in parallel convened the high level panel. They presented on 2018 the report. In 2020, um, uh, we, we received, as you all know, the roadmap for digital cooperation. And it's not a coincidence that the very first team is about global connectivity because it was really, it is, it continues to be the most important subject for all the humanity. And again, the recent uh, document, which is the common agenda, again, mentioned it as a one important, um, important subject. So I think um, mobile sector, uh, as, you, as you know, right now is, is presenting us the new evolution of mobile services by generation mobile services. Uh, but in some of our countries, most of our countries, we didn't have, uh, to, we didn't took the total advantage of 4G yet. And again, it's not because of lack of infrastructure, but because of the current business models. And that's one of the good things and efforts that in the side of private sectors, in the side of mobile providers could be a very good thing to, to, to contribute to this goal, hopefully, as well as some other actors as government in order to maybe reduce taxes, maybe reduce the right to use of license and frequencies, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, everyone needs to, to do our role in order to finally have this goal achieved uh, soon. So I think I'm going to stay there, hopefully to listen to some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, I, I want to, to jump in the conversation too, too and share with you my, my experience. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to install a local network in, in an indigenous village of Yanomami people. It was in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. Uh, there, there, there is no connection at all, even with sat satellite. Uh, the closest city, it was five hours boat ride. And uh, all indigenous people had cell phones. Why do they have cell phones with no connection? Uh, they they used to to buy memory cards with movies or music, and they used to exchange the memory cards between them. So the devices were a, a multimedia player. Uh, what we have done in that community, we installed uh, a VoIP app uh, called Elastic, and uh, they finally could use their phones for the first time to receive a call. Uh, and why do they, they need to receive a call? Sometimes they were in the middle of the village and they uh, need to all come to the, the, the river bank just to, to, to call someone to tell, oh, the food is ready or the, the meeting is starting. Uh, and now with that local network, they could uh, uh, call uh, them by the, by, by the phone. From this experience, what I learned uh, as meaningful access is that, is not, is that devices are not uh, enough uh, for, for a meaningful access. I, I also had another experience of installing a community network in the Amazon region in a riverside community. Uh, I I consider it my most challenging and uh, at the same time, the most successful experience. Uh, it was a Montaigne Mangabao community in Tapajós River. It was challenging because it was in the middle of the forest again, uh, but in that context, we have mountains. Uh, that is difficult for 
uh, internet infrastructure. Uh, uh, and in this case, uh, there was a, a satellite, uh, sa satellite connection and we taught them how to set up a mesh network. Uh, I consider it my uh, most successful experience because we were able to put fire on, on, on that people. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, they extend the, the network with new nodes in an autonomous way. Uh, in, in this case, uh, uh, meaningful access was uh, knowledge to be autonomous. Uh, and I share with you uh, 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 a third example uh, that is my favorite uh, example, that is Casa dos Meninos. That, uh, Casa dos Meninos is a grassroots organization, a very poor neighborhood in, in a big city in Sao Paulo. Uh, in their case, they had a local network without access to, to, to the internet by option. They did not want access to, to internet. Why does they, they not want <laughs> access to the internet? Everyone wants uh, access to internet. In their words, we do not want to create more Facebook users. Uh, imagine you the situation. Uh, um, uh, you, you have a network that covers uh, a public hospital and uh, a funeral site. You are in a line in the hospital waiting eight hours for an appointment. You have a phone, but you have no money to, to buy a data pack. What do you do? Oh, let me check if I'm lucky and if I find an open network. And you find that local network. And in that local network, there are local videos and other multimedia content produced by that community, 18, eight hours, what we watch that videos. Then uh, from this experience, as Adriano Labardini said, I learned that meaningful access is to, to have the opportunity to, to share local content too. Um, so I, uh, for a moderator, I have talked so much. Uh, I, I would like to, to give the, the, the word to, to Sonia to, to wrap up the, the session and uh, uh, ask if someone have comments uh, in, in the room and uh, give us uh, your inputs. Sonia. Thank you, Laura. Uh, there were a few questions that I think we still need to answer. I think there was one more question. I don't know if there's more than one online. Um, so I'll try to answer that. I think there was one from Joseph. Let me see. My team was trying to WhatsApp me so that I could see and let me know if there's anything else. I think one was about, um, so, or maybe it was a comment. I believe that we need specific regulations for leave no one behind. Any costs are too high. We need to look at alternative solutions. So um, tell me if there's anything else online. Okay, so on that, uh, and Joseph is here in the room, actually in the back of the room, so you don't see him, Laura. Um, so absolutely, I mean, one of the things that, one of the reasons why I invited also our colleagues earlier in the main session, and I invite you all here too, and those online to check, is the um, meaningful connectivity guide that our team developed. Actually, my colleague Natalia Fodish, who's also here online, um, very much worked very hard on that with the rest of the team. And one of the reasons why we prepared that guide was because we wanted to not just have the data and to create more evidence to show the reality, but also say, okay, what next? What are actions that can be done? And so the guide gives you a, a bit of an initial roadmap of different policy and regulatory actions that can be uh, taken to address the four dimensions of meaningful connectivity that Anna went through and described earlier. But most importantly too, and this is very much part of A4AI's, the Alliance for Affordable Internet's philosophy, is that um, we cannot leave everything to the market, right? We have to accept that markets and market competition not only is not a silver bullet, uh, it's no bullet at all, and in fact is not the only solution. It is a solution up to a certain point, but we have to understand where 
is that point in every single country, in every single community, so that we can fill those gaps with um, the whole gamut of public access solutions, just as Adriana was mentioning was done in Mexico, as it is being done in many countries that we were shared earlier in another session in Kenya, in Brazil, and um, et cetera. Countries that are, you know, being more innovative about filling those gaps. And in some countries, because of incomes, because of economic development conditions, it may be that you need the that kind of a balanced approach to reach 50% of the population. In some will be 10%. We don't know. We do know that uh, from our analysis and a lot of the research that we've done is that on average, this is a very kind of uh, top level average, on average, 10 to 20% of populations in uh, many countries um, cannot afford the internet, even if you bring it to a point that we call it affordable. And so for that percentage of the population in many countries, we need to have alternative solutions. And those alternative solutions, to the point that you were making, I think in that comment, they have to be either free or almost free of cost. But most importantly is that in many countries it's actually a lot more than 20%. In many countries where incomes are very low, it could be as high as 30% as, or, or as low as just 5%. You don't know. Either way, we need to make sure that everyone, regardless of the affordability threshold, can have access to what we call meaningful connectivity through alternative ways. Um, I see the colleague that was speaking earlier, shaking his hand, shaking his head, and I'm thinking, well, actually, here in this region of the world, and in other, in many parts of the world, including what Adriana mentioned in Mexico, many communities are finding alternative ways of providing connectivity and providing connectivity either uh, very low cost or free in some cases. And there is a reason for public interest and public policy to address those. So I just want to say for us, it's really important to find that balance of where the market can go, how far the market can go, allow and incentivize the market to go as far as it can go, but then government, civil society, and private sector absolutely have to take the responsibility of filling that gap. And if we don't, then we are not contributing to inclusion and equality. We in fact are contributing to further inequality and further exclusion. So I hope that makes sense. I see that uh, Joseph stood up, so maybe he has another comment, but Laura, I just wanted to make sure that you and the colleagues online, um, if, if you have any other questions or if that makes sense, and maybe Adriana and Roberto want to add more to that question. Roberto, I, I just had a comment to the business model, and I want to share with you something what we achieved now in Kenya, which is really, uh, I would say, the game changer. We got Safaricom in Kenya to deliver us SIM cards with five megabits per second without the cap for $58 per month for connecting schools. And that, to my mind, is really the first time that we got the telecom operator to change the business model to help us in connecting the 45 schools which we connected in the last two months. And I, I really believe that, that these models, we, ne we need to make them public. Because as you say, Sonia, the market only reacts if the market gets the pressure and gets the result. And what Safaricom has done, I'm so thankful. Fantastic news indeed. And this is the kind of light that we see through the tunnel. And it's this kind of experiences that we need to share in the policy network of meaningful access. It's very, very important for us to know about these experiences, to, to get together with all the, the stakeholders in our countries, to share them with this, this kind of experiences and hopefully to make them understand that there is a room, a big room of activities and, and actions and strategic, uh, strategic actions that we can do. So fantastic news. Thank you, Roberto. So if there's no other questions, Anna, would you like to add a couple of more points based on this discussion? Sorry? My hand is oh, raised. Oh, two hands raised. Okay, so I don't see them. I'm sorry. So uh, Laura, you have to help me online with the moderation. So Carlos, I think I heard your voice. Maybe you the first one. Go yes. for it, please. 
Okay, uh, I want just to make a point that which is, I think is very, very important. This spectrum, not a ghost, one of those in horror films, but the spectrum, the electromagnetic waves that connect us. It's very important that we follow very closely in our countries, the regulation of the spectrum, which may or may not allow universalization, democratization of spectrum. There are a few initiatives by regulators in some countries, which are very positive, others are not quite so. But this is fundamental that the community, the local communities can use the spectrum creatively with the new technologies, uh, secondary use of spectrum, software defined radios, whatever, to their, for their local communication. No? And uh, Rizomatica is one of the organizations in our group that is very specialized and ve has very good experiences in that. And other organizations as well in Africa and so on. So we should really organize ourselves to follow very close the policy regarding democratization of spectrum because this is crucial for meaningful access. Thank you. Very good point, Carlos. Thank you. I think Adriana, you next, you have your hands up. And my colleague tells me that uh, Giuliano also has his hand up. So Adriana, you go first and then Giuliano. Thank you, Sonia. Yes, it is very important to keep emphasizing in what are legal and regulatory barriers that are, are hindering this uh, democratic uh, use of spectrum, but universal access in general. There's a lot of opportunities to reduce barriers uh, so that these other models and even the market-based models can flourish. An important policy would be, for instance, to like in Brazil, to promote small, small operators with much less uh, regulatory burden. You don't want to regulate small providers as if they had market power. You put heavy regulation in those operators which have market power. And there's a, also a huge need and this goes also in Africa, in, in, in this continent and everywhere for more effective competition. We don't want a world of one mobile operator at the national level and not even two because they can coordinate and collude. So uh, much uh, more work on effective competition, lowering barriers for small operators, both commercial and not for profit and 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 keep we we all have to keep an eye of of the innovation in spectrum management uh, with all the technologies and models available and making sure that this dynamic databases that make it possible to share it, like for instance in the tv white spaces but that they are affordable because this dynamic um, spectrum sharing databases could be very expensive for for rural areas. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Really good points. Giuliano, I think it's your turn. All right. I'm trying to step back and, and there's a question in my mind, which is uh, if internet is helping vulnerable society groups to improve their lives, uh, so th there are enough research to support uh, the existence of the existence of uh, what we could call collateral damage of internet access, especially within vulnerable groups. We have also research to support internet plays a uh, role in witnessing public institution all around the world and even threaten democracy. Um, this is a, a result, among other causes, that derives from the deep imbalance in political disputes in society, most exercised within or mediated by the internet. Some groups are appropriating the internet to explore other weaker groups. 
In this sense, internet is a tool of the stronger to achieve their political goals, regardless boundaries, regulation, and even the governance social construction we build up so far. And of course, that I'm looking through a negative lenses, which uh, we may agree it's a, also a necessary approach. Well, in this case, shouldn't we question the extent that the concept of meaningful connectivity is increasing the reach and the power of the strong? Or we have to go beyond meaningful connectivity. We have to go beyond connectivity. We have to understand and agree over what are the key elements of internet access which could help urgently the vulnerable or weaker social groups to gain autonomy and capacity to act in order to achieve their political and personal goals. I think the concept of meaningful access should encompass these elements. And uh, I think that we should start to guide public policy to address uh, connectivity, considering these elements that could help internet to improve uh, society. This is my, my comment. Uh, I think someone might want to respond to you, not, uh, oh, you wanted to say something? Okay, why don't you go to that mic? Sorry. Maybe uh, can add something about uh, also the framework, legal framework. Um, by our constitution, meaningful access to the internet is a human right. So I think it's the beginning of the whole story. I agree with our colleagues from different countries. We have European regulation. We don't care actually about the radio frequencies because it's free. I'm talking about 2.5 and 5. But, and we have not, don't have this uh, bottlenecks, but when we talk about the business models and business sustainability of the uh, community networks or such kind of networks, it's very important to understand uh, how can we uh, cover uh, operational costs because it's existing challenge for every uh, network. That's my very small expression about. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Adrian, I don't know if you want to address that. That uh, it reminded me of many things that I heard you say in the past. So about sustainability of community networks and, and it also is related to a lot of the policy solutions around not just reducing, in many cases actually eliminating costs associated with spectrum, but uh, facilitating a, a completely different framework for connectivity that is for social purpose, for rural areas, for low-income communities, etc. cetera. Um, we're running out of time and I'm supposed to, as Laura just reminded me earlier, to have a quick summary. Uh, and we have exactly two minutes and 26 sec mm -hmm. seconds to do that. So um, first of all, thank you to those of you who participated in the session today. Thank you to Anna, to Roberto here in person. Thank you to Laura, Carlos, Giuliano, Luisa, everybody that has made this possible, including my colleague Natalia coordinating everything. Thank you, Adriana, for joining from Mexico. Uh, I hope it was useful. Uh, we invite you to look at a lot of the information that is being published that we have on our website, and that many of the organizations that you heard here speak uh, are also sharing. So maybe my team also shared some on the chat. Uh, feel free to reach out to us anytime. Um, I wanted to say uh, as a closing remark, hearing some of your questions, having spoken to so many people here at IGF. First, I'm really pleased to have had the opportunity and thank you, Roberto, and to your colleague Karim and Carlos and others for bringing me to this policy network. I'm really pleased that we are thinking about this in a new way. I'm also uh, very pleased that uh, we are using this momentum in a way that is unique. You know, for many years, as Carlos pointed out, and you made me, you made me feel very old, Carlos, just so you know. Um, he kept looking at the history and when all of the discussions on universal access uh, started. Um, and to me, it's like, well, that means I've been doing this for close, that, close to 30 years. That's not a good sign because that means we didn't make as much progress as we thought in 30 years. Uh, we did make 
some progress, but there's many more demands. There's many more things. Technology and innovation have evolved in completely new ways, right? Um, I was telling some of my team uh, that about just about 25 years ago, I was timing my ability to go uh, change, I mean, um, transfer files at night at midnight on a dial-up connection to send my work back to the office, to my colleagues. And this was just 25 years ago. We, we live in a very different world and that also comes with very different responsibilities and duties. And so what I always like to remind myself and others is that as digital citizens, as citizens of a digital society, we have rights, we must demand for better and for the right quality of connectivity, but we also have a duty as citizens. And that duty, it's both in terms of how do we use, how do we share, can we be safe, do we know how to use privacy, are we uh, do we have the skills, the digital skills to allow us to be really strong dis digital citizens? And if we don't, we need to work at that and we need to help the next person next to us to do the same. And I think this collective responsibility of not only making sure that we can bring better and more connectivity to the world also comes with a personal and collective responsibility is really important. So I wanna leave you with that, that meaningful connectivity and meaningful access in general um, comes with that collective responsibility and we all have a role to play. We as the Alliance for Affordable Internet, the MAG here at IGF, all of you present here, we all have a role to play as private sector, civil society, governments, foundations, do it. And if you don't know what to do, I can tell you that our Meaningful Connectivity Guide has some good ideas for you. So take a look at it. And if you want to know more, ask anyone from our team. There's many of us here. And thank you again. Thank you to the colleagues at Nick as well for organizing, for pulling it all together. Laura, Luisa, Giuliano. Thank you, thank you, thank you. From uh, Katavici, we say goodbye to you and thank you for everything. Bye-bye. <laughs>